Thursday, July 13, 2023. Hello, dear friends. How are you doing today? I hope you're doing great. Lucent Boy from Beth, thank you for dropping in and saying hi. And Beth, of course, thank you for all your support. Larice, you're always checking in and saying hi. Thank you, Larice, for supporting me and watching my videos. Angie Monzor, God bless you. I hope you're doing well. Thank you so much. And of course, my sweet dear angel, Ati Shawe. I pray that you have a blessed day, Ati Shawe. I always try and drop in and say hi when you're live. And um, you uh, encourage my heart a lot. The reason I make these videos is that I try and think of somebody that may be interested that I could talk to. In particular, um, I have two daughters that I'm estranged from that, they, that they're busy with their lives. But maybe down the road someday they might... Um, be interested in some topic or something like that or maybe somebody that I I don't even know but I'm hoping that people that I know and care about might drop in and you know be interested in in, in one of these topics uh, perhaps this particular gentleman or book or maybe some student has to study them in some liberal arts college somewhere and they want to get a second opinion and so I'm hoping that it might be helpful but of course is very selfish is the main reason that helps me to express myself and think if I do this once a day and um, remind myself that I need to keep my mind sharp and study now that I'm retired that I, I need to stay active and I make it part of my routine it, it can be very helpful for myself as well but I pray for my daughters wherever they may be if they happen to see this someday down the road or maybe their children who knows their children their grandchildren you start getting a, a feeling for long term when you read somebody like Freeman Dyson because he spends a lot of his time thinking very, very long term, a lot longer term than I could ever think. But um, in any event, I finally found something that I disagree with him. So um, that's encouraging as well. You know, uh, when you read somebody that challenges your way of thinking, it, it has a tendency to focus your mind and hopefully sharpen your mind. So today I'm going to be covering chapters 18 to 21, 18, 19, 20 and 21. Chapter 18 is called Thought Experiments, and in this chapter, he talks about uh, futuristic te technology, the idea of self-replicating technology. So different types of automatons, and um, they were, you know, at the time that this is written, you're at the very beginning of computer technology. Um, and so he gives some very uh, insightful uh, comments on the mathematics of replication uh, in terms of uh, you know doubling in size and and so on but I'm not going to bore you with that because it is a little bit obscure uh, I'm going to go right on to chapter 19 which is called extraterrestrials in this chapter chapter 19 he examines the chances and the expected evidence of alien life um, and he quotes uh, extensively from uh, J.S. Haldane again and uh, from his uh, thoughts and um, he makes uh, uh, some sharp comments that I'll share with you in the uh, comment section below this video but again I'm not going to go into much detail here um, and um, I like that there's a there's a, a, a statement that jumped out at me so I'll share this one with you um, and maybe I'll just share a couple from this chapter because I have time here uh, on the bottom of page 209, he says, I reject as worthless all attempts to calculate from theoretical principles the frequency of occurrence of intelligent life forms in the universe. Our ignorance of the chemical processes by which life arose on Earth makes such calculations meaningless. Depending on the details of the chemistry, life may be abundant in the universe, or it may be rare, or it may not exist at all outside our own planet. Nevertheless, there are good scientific reasons to pursue the search for evidence of intelligence with some hope for, su for a successful outcome. So he gives a very pragmatic description uh, compared to some people who say, oh, there has to be a life out there somewhere because of the numbers. He's, he's very based in his, in his uh, analysis of the future. He spends a lot of time trying to talk about the future. And I'll just continue here a little bit. He says, now comes my main point. Given plenty of time, there are few limits to what a technological society can do. Take first the question of colonization. Interstellar distances look forbiddingly large to human colonists since we think in terms of our short human lifespan. In one man's lifespan, we cannot go very far. But a long-lived society will not be limited by a human lifetime. 
If we assume only a modest speed of travel, say 100 the speed of light, an entire galaxy can be colonized from end to end within 10 million years. A speed of 1% of light velocity could be reached by a spaceship with nuclear propulsion, even using our present primitive technology. So the problem of colonization is a problem of biology and not of physics. And he goes on. Again, I'm not going to bore you. He goes on. But I, I like this chapter that he, he's talking about the uh, the chances of extraterrestrial life. And, and, and he's very um, down to earth in his approach. Um, <clears throat> Uh, I'm going to, I'm going to include some of his comments, um, and I'll, I'll leave you with one last comment from the chapter, but I'll add it again in the, in the uh, summary below. It says a reasonable long range program of searching for evidence of intelligent life in the universe is in, indistinguishable from a reasonable long range program of general astronomical exploration. And so that's, that's, that's a good summary of the chapter really, because he's advocating for astronomical observation and continuing study of the cosmos and by default that also includes a search for alien life so he says you don't really have to go out and search for alien life per se although he does go into a lot of detail about searching for specific bandwidths of uh, radio frequencies but that's a whole other thing but but in essence he's saying we should study the cosmos and by default we're going to be looking for alien life anyway so if it if it shows up great it'd be a bonus and then we go on to uh, chapter 20, uh, which is called Clades and Clones. And in this chapter, he's examining, uh, essentially examining the evolution of uh, multiple languages. He gives his theory on why humans um, ended up having a fragmented language. And of course, he, uh, he relies on Darwin, but as it has happened so often in the past, and it continues to happen very, very often, is that he takes the observations of Darwin and he extrapolates them to absurd conclusions, in my opinion. Um, and this is where I diverge from uh, his particular theory. Um, and there are the very specific uh, arguments that he makes, for example, on, on the bottom of page 220, where he's going in and describing how multiple languages could have um, developed on earth um, and it's a very convoluted argument to 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 give it as much um, credence as I can um, you know the three fundamental inventions he says here on page 221 the three fundamental inventions made by life before the evolution of higher organisms began were death sex and speciation death to enable the future to be different from the past, sex to enable genetic characteristics to be rapidly mixed and shared, and speciation, the forming of species isolated from each other by genetic barriers to make possible the evolution of diversity. These three inventions were all required before living creatures could have elbow room to adapt themselves in shape and behavior to fill the rich variety of ecolog ecological niches that their growing diversity was itself beginning to offer them. Well, he's... D d describing from the past he, he's he's fitting in his observation of the of three main characteristics of of life into uh, and and mapping it onto his reasoning right um and it, it it as he continues on it begins to bog down and fail again in my opinion uh he gives some analogies which i, I believe they are, are dubious or, or weak i mean they're a stretch at best um and so, again, I'm not going to go into much detail on here. Page 223, he's got a long argument there. Um, but this, I got a, a little fly that's really bothering me. Not anymore. Bye. Um, pardon me. And then chapter 21 is called The Greening of the Galaxies. Uh, sorry, The Greening of the Galaxy. And um, he... Um, goes in and talks about, uh, he, he sets up two types of technology, which he calls gray technology and green technology. And his idea of green technology is not so much what we consider green technology today as something that's, you know, uh, carbon neutral or, or something that, um, uh, it's a little different, his definitions of gray and green. Gray is, is um, um, 
here he says, you know, human technology is gray. God's technology is green. Clones are gray. Clades are green. Army field manuals are gray. Poems are green. Um, he says, why should we not simply say gray is bad and green is good and find a quick path to salvation by embracing green technology and banning everything gray? Because to answer the world's materials needs, technology has to be not only beautiful but also cheap. We delude ourselves if we think that the ideology of green is beautiful will save us from the necessity of making difficult choices in the future any more than other ideologies have saved us from difficult choices in the past. And again, he's sort of justifying his own past history of developing, you know, atomic weapons, right? This is gray. You can't get any grayer than that. Um, and so he's saying that green is good, uh, like developing technology where you would have self-replicating organic um, trees that they would plant on comets and asteroids and all this stuff so that they could, you know, he goes into this really, you know, sci-fi, biosphere, the whole nine yards, and this would be green technology. Whereas he, he's essentially saying, you read between the lines, he's essentially saying we need gray technology when there's difficult choices to be made. In other words, when you got to, you know, go to a war with your enemies, it, it's not a, not a, there's not a soft way to say it, although he kind of leaves it out, uh, but you can get what he's saying there, right? Uh, gray rather than green, designed for utility rather than beauty. Um, and so he, he, he spends a lot of time talking about the difference between gray and green technology and how um, each one has its place, um, uh, but um, it's, you know, it's, it's essentially he's getting in the realm of sci-fi and he's going off uh, being a futurist and, um, you know, uh, he says, humanity requires a larger and freer habitat. We do not live by bread alone. Why he would include that, it's, it's, um, it's a non-sequitur there for some reason he includes that. But again, he's dropping hints that he is a spiritual man and that he is a man familiar with scripture. Um, diversity on the social level means preserving a multiplicity of languages and cultures and allowing room for the growth of new ones in the face of the homogenizing influences of modern communications and mass media. So yeah, he puts a, a strong value on, on the diversity of humanity. And again, to return to the idea of how glo globalism started and how it's going today. You see countries, they're contributing to, you know, uh, green technology. They're contributing to uh, these causes uh, on a global basis. And really what the individual nation states are doing is they're contributing to the global government, to the world government, to the United Nations and associated organizations in the hopes of being able to um, have a safer and better future for humanity. The problem is, is that they keep their underlying motives hidden from the populace. They don't want to be honest and forthright with what it is they're doing, and they use a lot of subterfuge and mass media communication as a cloak because they feel that the plebs, the, uh, the great unwashed, the, 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 the common man cannot handle the truth, as the saying goes, right? And so a lot of what is done at these upper levels of, of uh, society are hidden from the average Joe in the street. Um, and so he's got some very interesting stuff. Some of it is really mind expanding and, and mind blowing um, where he goes here. Um, and so if you're into sci-fi, you'd probably get a real kick out of uh, these last couple of chapters. I'm not, I'm not really a sci-fi guy, but um, in any event, I'm going to leave that. How are we doing for time? Oh my gosh, I can't believe it. I'm so sorry. Um, but anyway, uh, we're going to continue on. It's a, it's a great book. Again, I don't agree with everything. He gets a little off base in a couple of areas, but um, still a very powerful read, a very um, inspiring read for anybody that's interested in, in um, thought experiments and science and all that kind of good stuff. So thank you so much again for watching. God bless you. I love you very much. I hope you're doing well. And I uh, hope you're able to spend time with people you love and get fresh air and don't watch television. <laughs> Turn off the television, get outside and get some fresh air. They call it programming for a reason, right? Don't let yourself be programmed. Listen to people that are smarter than you are, like this guy here, um, who was a great scientist, and see what they're thinking. Get their thoughts on things and try and...
try and get a broad perspective and not just what the mass media wants you to believe. I hope that helps. So God bless you. Thank you again for watching. We'll talk to you again soon, okay? Take care of yourself. Have a great weekend that's coming up. Today's Thursday. So yeah, we're almost there. Talk to you later. Bye-bye.